first name, but pray for Monica's dad. And I'm sure the Lord will bring him out of it. But the, the neat thing is um, that she has her, her dad now that she can sort of look after. And he's got a daughter that he hadn't been in contact with now that he's having a little problem that he can sort of look to. I think that's really a nice way the Lord gives a happy ending. Amen? Yeah. Season changed for them. You know, imagine 12 years, not a word. Didn't even know where he was. And then the Lord just worked it out, actually gave her dreams ahead of time, which to me is another precious thing about God. You just you can't make this, thing, this kind of stuff up. You know, it just boggles your mind. This uh, first song is uh, my dad's, one of my dad's first favorite, I should say, scriptures. Um, he had us, um, uh, he read it before, not too long before he passed away. And uh, it's a nice, kind of old fashioned, full gospel song, right out of the Psalms. So let's stand together and we'll give the Lord praise today. Amen. Say it with me ten times and you'll feel better after number ten. Praise the Lord. Praise you, Lord. 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 Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Thanks for Paul's testimony. All men forsook me at the first. Nevertheless, the Lord stood with me and delivered me. Hallelujah. Thank you for what you did for Paul and through Paul on our behalf so that we can rejoice thousands of years later as we read what he wrote under your inspiration. See our lives changed forever because of the gospel of grace and glory. Hallelujah. Bless your wonderful name, Lord. Bless your wonderful name. Bless your wonderful name. I feel like the Lord's reminding us that his hand is not short. 
that it can't reach us, that it can't save us. A real unusual word might be for somebody watching by Facebook or YouTube archived, who knows when. Might be for somebody in the room, I don't know. Um, not too long ago, I was going downstairs to get in the car and um, had the checkbooks with me because we had to do some stuff on the computer with our, our uh, church business. And the I won't go into how it happened, but the checkbooks dropped out of my hand down between the stairs and the wall in the cellar. You have that cold chill go through you, you know. Yeah, it's all walled in. Where, how will you retrieve it? So I sat there and I thought about it a little bit and I could see them, you know. The first one I was able to get out, not too bad. The church one, naturally, it was stuck. I put my little stubby digits down there, you know, trying to get it. I tried everything I could think of. I got a pair of tweezers. Nothing was going to do it, you know. I thought, Lord, stick with me or I'm stuck. This is aggravating. I got to get this out because I'm kind of OCD. I got to get to church, get everything sorted, get all the bills figured. And uh, reaching down again, and I was, it was almost like the Lord gave me an extension on my little digits, you know. And boom, next thing I knew, it was in my hand. And while we're worshiping, right, right from the get-go this morning, it's like I see the hand of the Lord, literally the, the hand of God, the fingers of God reaching into tight places in our lives. Like reaching into a place where something is that shouldn't be there. We can't get it, but he can, and boom, it's gone. Or reaching into a place that's empty that ought to have something there. We can't get to it to bring the supply. And I see the hand of the Lord reaching in the tight place, the place we can't get a hold of, and adding it. That's unusual. It was like watching a movie. And I thought, really? Why not? Everything God tells us is good. Amen? So if that fits your deal, if, if you need something you can't get where you need it, realize today that the hand of the Lord is not short it, it's not too short to make it and he can he, if you've got to get involved he can even give you extensions some way or another whether that's literal or you know metaphysically uh, he can get you sorted so that you can take care of it amen and uh if you can't and you need him to do it directly bless god he can do it amen he can you had that was a happy preacher that left that garage with both checkbooks that was a happy <laughs> preacher hallelujah i just well i don't know how in the world how in the world? I couldn't get my fingers in there, and bless God, there it is. I like surprises, don't you? He's awesome. Oh, I love this song. We sang this in Greece, and uh, you should hear the Greeks sing it. Almost sounds more anointed in Greek. But that's a holy language. How many know it's a holy language? You better wave, say yes. Yeah, no Greek, no New Testament. Amen? The Master gave us most of his teaching and conversation in Greek. Praise God. Angel Drummer. Thank you. 
praise your name. Sometimes when things go well for me, I start to feel proud of myself. And then I have to remember <laughs> there's a big difference between being grateful for what you have and what you can do and being proud of what you have and what you can do. <laughs> so I always remember to turn it around. And um, I just want to thank God. I, <laughs> I had one of those weird little moments where if you really contact God over something really small and he hears you and it means so much. I got a weather station for my birthday, and it had two units in it, one for indoors and one for outdoors, because when I was at home, I was curious about what was going on at the barn. And sure enough, I had all these different connections that enabled me to see what was inside the barn, but I could not get that outdoor module to connect to it. And this week, I was sitting there all alone after everyone had left, and I was praying. It was like I could see through all the clouds and the stars and the ends of the galaxies and the universe and I saw Yahweh and I said now Yahweh if there's some reason you don't want this little unit to work that's okay with me but they sure would appreciate it if you would make it work and I tried it two more times now we're talking about something I had tried like 20 times and it connected and I was just so astounded and I felt so blessed. And then, on top of that, I was able to take it outside, like 20 feet away through a metal wall with a closed window, and it's still working. So, <laughs> he really does care about the oh, little things. Oh, man, does he? Takes care of the big stuff and the little stuff. There's a chance to be grateful for what he did instead of proud that I made it Amen. work. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Lord, I. Praise the Lord. Can you lower her mic a little bit? She thinks her mic's too. Can you lower um, Barb's mic a little bit, Jeff? My mic Just seems a bit. too hot. Okay. And then I can hardly hear Shar. We used to uh, we used to sing this song and speed her up, but since the angel drummer charges extra for changing tempo, <laughs> we're just going to leave it what he can do, man. He he work he works cheap, he works cheap. Isn't it nice to pay pay a musician and never pay him again? We paid him once. He's here, right? There he is, <laughs> right down there. Right there. He's a little guy. Fits in a box. Take him with you. Praise the Lord. I love this song. Beautiful song.
Jesus. I will reign over your life if you let me. But many hold back. They shrink back. They withdraw as I come close. Do an about face today, says the Lord. Stop being stingy with your cares and concerns. But cast them all on me, for I have broad shoulders. And not only do I carry your cares, but I'm carrying you. I hold you in my bosom. Your name is written on my heart. I look at the palms of my hands and I see your face. If you can count the sands of the seashore, you can count my thoughts toward you. If you can count the stars of the sky, then you can count my thoughts toward you. Your steps are ordered of me, says the Lord, and I'm infatuated with you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We love you, Lord, so much. Hallelujah. None but Thank you, Lord. you, Jesus. You're all we need. Thank you, Lord. All we need, Thank Lord. you, Jesus. You're all we need, Lord. There are some of you that hold back and what you hold on to is getting smaller. You have thought, I cannot reach out to others while I myself am in need. I cannot give patience when I'm in need of patience. I cannot reach out with words and deeds of compassion when I myself am brokenhearted and need compassion. I cannot afford to bless the kingdom when I myself am in need. And yet what you hold on to will only shrink before your eyes and get smaller. But what you release will only get bigger, says the Lord. For as you sow of your time, your talent, your energy, yes, your compassion, your words and deeds of love, as you share your seeds of faith with the work of God, as you share your compassion, as you share your listening ear and understanding heart, you will find a vacuum opened up in your life that I will fill through others of my children that are doing likewise. And as you give, you will receive. As you will release, you will find. As you distribute, you will gain. As you humble, you will be exalted. And you will learn the keys of the mysteries of the kingdom of God. That the one who would become great and more should become less and lower. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Don't let the devil tell you that, of course, things are going worse and worse because you're getting older. Because I'm a living testimony that things can get better and better when you get older. <laughs> I'm doing better now Amen. that I've turned 65 than I was in my 20s or 30s. Amen. So, praise God. It's all Amen. he's doing. Hallelujah. You, know? you, have to, you have to have the praise supernatural because the, the natural is just not enough. The best is yet to come. Amen. Have in the spirit. Amen. Checks. No, I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. I aggravate her with that, but, you know, just so she knows. We, we got her number. She's doing residency, her residency up in uh, Dayton. She wanted to be a Jewish or Christ, I think. I don't want to speak out of turn. Uh, I might as well embarrass her since she's able to make it today, right? You know, she went, she went out of town, she and her family, for kind of a vacation and also to suss out where she could do a residency. And uh, I asked her how things went, you know, and, 
And she just kind of shrugged her shoulders, said nothing really appealed to her. And she said, I, I really like to stay here. I said, well, we'd like you to stay here. I said, you want to stay in greater Cincinnati? Why? And she said, I said, excuse me? She said, this church. Can you believe that? Can you believe? Isn't that something? That really touches me. You know, a lot of people say, well, I'll go get a job where the best market is and then find a church rather than I need to find out the best church in the area and then find a job that's there. You know, that's a thought. We're glad to see you, Stella. If you check my blood pressure on the way out. <laughs> no. Um, Wednesday, we've got, uh, we've got Greg Jackson ministering. Wave, Greg. <laughs> Hallelujah. And I don't know what it, what it is, but it'll be good. It's always good. I'll be here, so I'll know if you supported his ministry. But uh, he's going to be sharing the word on Wednesday. And again, pray for Monica's dad. What is his first name, Greg? I can never think of it. Isn't that something? I can't. She told me, and I can't think of it. Yeah, because, well, he, okay. Well, he, he's never, I guess, met him, have you? And have you met him in person ever? Yeah. Oh, you did, okay. But 12 years since she really was close with him, so that's a lot of, a lot of water under the bridge. But anyway, pray for Monica's uh, dad who suffered this heart issue. Um, and God knows how to get us out of things, amen? amen? Here's a good word came from Africa from one of our students, Mazum, Mazuba, I'm not sure what country. Um, I'm not sure what course he's on, but he says, I thank God who enabled me to follow this ministry. I completed all three courses. The knowledge and wisdom that I acquired through this training is a big blessing to our ministry and, and the community at large. I'm now a minister who teaches others with equipped biblical knowledge. Amen. I really like this. I received the books via post in 2014. I've been studying them. When I applied, I indicated I'm facing financial challenges. We usually say you too. And my request was approved by your ministry. I have a copy which you wrote to me which approved sponsorship. Furthermore, passed all three exams. Don't have money to pay for the, the uh, courses, but I'll greatly appreciate help. And so he's, he's helped. Amen? Amen? We helped him. If you can help him, help him. And we did. Amen. So there's good things happening. So don't, don't forget about Greg this Wednesday. And he's going to have something wonderful from the, the Lord. I like to get ministry one, two once in a while, and I've been knocking my brains out finishing this book on the Lord's Supper, but I think it's going to help people. And hopefully we can get it done within the next couple of weeks, I hope. Um, hey, preacher, didn't you say we were going to have a movie and a book next week? Well, yeah, but I honestly, I prayed about it. And what we're going to do is, is if you weren't here, we're going to just delay that till right around our anniversary, first part of December. I'd like to maybe have a movie night, uh, one of the documentaries about Martin Luther, and we'll have my book there free for people that visit and for you guys. And so let's kind of look toward the end of November and the turn of the month around our, our uh, anniversary time for that. Um, thanks for praying for us and for helping us. Lots of good things are happening every day. I'll share that in just a minute. Something else came, came through the pipe this week, which really blessed me. But if you have your Bible with you this morning, turn to the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes. We're going to be in chapter 1. I'm going to look at two verses. Most of you are familiar with this. Some of us have this memorized. Um, did I say chapter 1, chapter 3? Sorry. Verse 1 and verse 4. And I, most of us, I think, know this. Uh, they put this on greeting cards and, and, and so on. Um, so we're going, to, we're going to look at this. And, and asking the question, is it time for a change? Is it time for a change? Ecclesiastes chapter, chapter 3, verse 1 and verse 4. Is it time for a change in your life, in mine, in the church, in the ministry? To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. And then verse 4, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. I was leaving for church the other day, and I was on my way uh, up the, the street for a, a couple of things I had to do before church, so I went, turned left. And just as I'm at the corner turning, I look into this big billboard for one of the local establishments there, and it says, Autumn, season of change. How many of you know when God talks to you, you, you realize it? And he can talk to us just about any way he wants. When I saw that sign on that business, it just kind of resonated with me, because we're in autumn, aren't we? Autumn, the season of change. How many would like to have something change in your life now? Yeah. I'm ahead of you. I wanted it to change yesterday. And so I thought, well, it's not something. I wonder if there's a message in there. 
I wonder if there's a teaching or a Bible study in there. And I, I made the turn. And over on the right, there are a lot of political signs, people you know, pushing the ground. And I saw one that wasn't political. And it said, you matter. It's like, boom. Yeah. And I thought, wow. And I could feel the tears starting, you know. And I passed that. I thought, that's not political. I looked in my rearview mirror. There's one on the other side. Don't give up. I thought that's a trifecta. Autumn, the season of change. You matter. Don't give up. Three points, all I need is the poem, and we're ready. And it just continued to resonate with me. And I got to the ch church, and I began working on this message. It just kind of came out. And then just last night, I think it was last night, the night before, there was a little news clip about who's putting these little signs up all over the west side. Uh, because of teen suicide and some other things, they're putting these little encouraging signs uh, around the area. And I thought, how awesome is that? Don't know whether they're believers or not, but God certainly is imp impressing people to do some positive stuff in the midst of all the negative. Amen? And as I thought about those three signs, one after the other, I believe it was a word from God for you, for me, for our fellowship, for our outreach ministry, and for perhaps some folks that will watch us by Facebook or YouTube or listening uh, to a download or, or, or in getting this message some other way, maybe through a CD. Let's look at that first thing. Autumn, the season of change. Remember who's talking here in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. King Solomon. The Bible says of him he was the wisest man on planet earth apart from Jesus. The wisest man who would ever walk the earth. One scripture says he was even wiser than and lists some people that were considered wise men from the east. How many of you know people today are still looking to people from the far east for wisdom? They've given up on so-called American Christianity and many are going into eastern religions. Isn't it something that King Solomon specifically was pointed out as someone who was wiser than the men of the far east? It's like that guy that traveled the world looking for diamonds and all the while they were in his own backyard and he just hadn't found them. Sometimes what's, what we need is closer to us than we imagine. Listen, who's talking here? The wisest man of all, King Solomon. For everything, an appointed time. Another version has it. Everything has its appointed season. Another. There is a fixed time. Everything must be done by turns, is another version. There are two kinds of time in the Bible, broadly speaking. And if I, when I looked at the Greek version of this verse from the Old Covenant, the one that Jesus and the early church used, I find out that the word here is chronos, which means chronological time. How many have ever had a chronograph watch? Seconds, minutes, and so on. That means particular time on the clock, a particular day, month, year, etc., etc. The other word is keros, which means a season. We talk about windows of opportunity. Interestingly, Hebrew equivalents of both of those words are in this portion of Scripture, in the same verses we're looking at. Isn't that something? There's a fixed time, and there's also a season for everything under heaven. Now, this first word, this first word, for everything an appointed time, as on your watch, is fascinating. It appears just a few times in the Old Covenant. The word zima means time or a date, okay? For example, it was used not only here but twice in the book of Esther. Do you remember when the Jews were saved from destruction by that wicked Haman and they, they, they established a feast celebrating their freedom? That wasn't just done a different time every year whenever the Jews took a notion. There was a set fixed time for the Feast of Purim, right? And Jewish folk today still celebrate that. It was a fixed time. Couldn't change it. Again, when Nehemiah wanted to visit Jerusalem, he told the pagan king that he worked with, I'm going to go to my hometown, and here's when I'm going to be there. In other words, he was the king's cupbearer. He was close to him, and he couldn't just up and go, how long are you going, Nehemiah? Oh, I don't know. I'll send you a postcard. He had to let him know how long he was going to be there. It was a fixed time on the calendar. Same word. And then it appears here, of course. And so the idea is, with some items, you and I cannot write our own ticket. With apologies to some of our hyper-faith people, you cannot just adjust things that God has at a fixed time. For example, when he put Abraham in a deep sleep 
and told him, your people will be in bondage for four centuries, Abraham could have fasted till his pants fell down to change that, and he couldn't do it. When did Israel come out of bondage in Egypt? After 400 plus years, Jeremiah was told by Yahweh, as we looked last week, there are going to be 70 years determined upon your people. Because of their idolatry, because of their turning a deaf ear and a blind eye to me, I'm going to let the Babylonians come here, plunder Jerusalem, remove them from their promised land, and they're going to be out of that land for 70 years. Again, Jeremiah could have fasted till his pants fell down, couldn't have changed anything. It was a fixed time. I heard somebody talk about the power of God that we have to, to fix the weather, you know. Well, bless God, weather comes my way, I, I just speak to it, you know. Too bad we couldn't find these guys when the hurricanes came. You and I can't do something just off our own bat, amen? There are some things that are fixed, right? For example, when did Jesus come? When did Jesus arrive on planet Earth, according to Paul? In the fullness of of time. There was a fixed time. Why did he come a century earlier? Two, three centuries later. Why didn't he come later? Earlier. Why? Fixed time. When Jesus came, because of the Jews, there was the idea in the mind of humanity of one God. It was finally established there's one God. When Jesus came, because of Alexander's conquest of the Middle East, there was one language, kind of like English today. You can have your own vernacular, but most people also speak English. One, one language that would allow the early church to spread the gospel to the known world. Because of Rome, there was one beautiful set of roads that would enable people to travel and bring the gospel. Isn't that beautiful? There was an intersection of those three big things when Jesus came, and no one could change that. We couldn't bring him one day earlier, fixed time. But then there's this other word, meaning season. And a season for every desire under the heavens. How many see the difference? Fixed time for everything, that's God's point of view on certain things he's got in his divine sovereign will that none of us can change. And then when it comes to seasons, it's about what you and I desire or plan to do. How many are tracking with me? Subtle change, but it's important. It's important. A season for every desire under the heavens. A proper time for every happening. There's a right time, another version says, for everything we want to do. Another version, for every business. How many have found that one out? Oh gosh, I want to retire at 55, Greg. I didn't make it and Greg did. And he's still gloating. He's still gloating. Actually, I wanted to retire at 50. Didn't happen. It wasn't fixed in God's mind. It was a desire of mine, but it wasn't the season. <laughs> oh, I'm getting myself depressed. I could preach myself happy again. You understand what I'm talking about, don't you? How long have you been hearing about the Lord's Supper book? Long time. I look back at my notes. You know, I started writing that two years ago. And I'd, sometimes I'd get a little bit done, make some notes, and I couldn't go further. I couldn't go further. And then this last year, it seemed like it was the right season, finally. And I finally basically got it done. And do you know what? Some of you may not know. I dedicated my book to Martin Luther, and I had no idea when I really picked up speed this season and really got into working on it. I had no idea. This is the 500th year anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. How awesome is that? that God worked that out. And I can put a little article on our website. We're going to put an article in the paper and hopefully show this little documentary and have my book ready. It all kind of worked together. Why? Because there was a proper time for this happening. There was a right time for what I wanted to do. There was a right time for this business. And it wasn't two years ago. It was now. Cheer up. Autumn. Season of change, maybe for you. It's been for me. I trust it will be for everyone in this fellowship and for our ministry. Amen. Speaking of the Reformation, probably it couldn't have happened at another time. There were many reformers before Martin, and they did some good. But on a large scale, there was no formal, long-standing, earth-shaking Reformation until Martin Luther came along. And one reason is because of the printing press. Did you know that Luther was the best-selling author in Europe? He didn't even try to get published. People got his messages in his little booklets and they published them without his knowledge. He never got any royalties. 
And he found out at one point he was the best-selling author in Europe. Well, don't you think that helped? The Reformation? It was right around that same time a, a Bible scholar by the name of Erasmus began to make the study of the Greek New Testament popular again. One of the first things Martin Luther did when he started his Reformation was get his theologian friend Philip Melanchthon to teach him Hebrew and Greek. And Martin Luther began to study those scriptures in the original languages, and more on that next week. And wow, did his life change. And that Greek New Testament went to the printing press. And the church of the day that had had the entire Christian world in its thrall realized the jig was up. I've got some quotes I can read to you sometime. What the higher-ups in the church of that day said when the people in the ministry began to read the Greek New Testament. They were, they were shaking in their boots because they knew the jig was up. And God's inspired New Testament was bringing light that had been missing for a thousand years in a lot of the church. Isn't it wonderful that God's got a season? That first word... Uh, zima means a time or a date. Things, things that God has set that we can't change. This word, eth, is a little different. In looking at life as circular as it, as it is in sometimes repetitive events, the rising and setting of the sun, the moon and the stars being visible and then invisible. So they, they use this word sometimes to describe a unique event within that circle. And so, you know, there's pastor studying and praying and preaching and studying and praying and preaching. And then there's pastor starting to write the book and then getting distracted and then getting back to it. And get, you guys with me? You started something and you lost your gas. You lost your motivation. You got back into it and then you lost your motivation. And finally, you said, bless God, you woke up one morning and sink or swim. I'm going to get this thing done. And you realize it was the right time. It was the right season. Aren't you glad God, God has that inspiration for us? To do that unique event in the midst of that repetitive circle of our life. Look at the next couple of verses in Ecclesiastes 3. You see our life. The whole gamut is there, isn't it? Time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, time to pluck up, which is plant, time to kill, time to heal, time to break down, time to build up. In our text today, a time to weep, time to laugh. Time to mourn and a time to dance. A couple of people have asked me, why don't we dance in this church? I said, sister, bring it on. <laughs> who's, who's stopping you? Amen. If you want to swing from the chandelier, if you can get it, get it. <laughs> Boy, I wish some of these folks would get on fire. Why don't you get on fire in the meantime? Amen. Did I tell you about the guy that told me he wouldn't let me know what was going on in the church? <clears throat> Why things weren't happening the way they should? My first question, of course, I didn't ask it, but my first question was, how would you know? Hadn't seen him for three years. Yeah, called me. Hey, pastor, I'd like to have a little chat with you, let you know why things aren't going right at the church. I'm thinking, what church? Where you go, you ain't going here. I mean, like free advice. Not me. What's it worth? About what he's charging you. I said, no, pass. No, really, I want to let, I said, how would you know? Dead air. How do you know what's going on in the church? You haven't been here. Well, yeah. Wow. Wow. Everything's here, right? Everything's here, but it's on its own season, and those seasons change. So autumn could be, your season of change could be mine. It could be mine. Could be yours. Could be the churches. Could be our ministries. You've been down the directory lately? Take a little trip down directory lane sometime. I find it fascinating. We come here on a Sunday. I wonder where, you know, wow. It used to be a lot different than it is. What? Dead, 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 moved, school, school, work, work, family problem, re rehab. Just go, wow. No mystery. I told a friend of mine, I said, you know, attendance has changed so much. Wouldn't it be neat if it was one thing that was behind people not being here? Too long service, too short service, music too loud, music not loud enough, whatever. One thing you can fix. Don't like them red pews. We want blue. You, know, you could fix. But this, no, there's nothing wrong. It's called what? Life. What's life about, preacher? Let me direct you to King Solomon. Read chapter 3 of Ecclesiastes. That's life. 
big time, underlined, circled, and highlighted. In the midst of the seasons of change and the, the, the times that God has set, there's you and there's me. Amen? And the good news is what that second sign said. You matter. I matter. Why does God have fixed points for certain things? Because his people matter. It mattered to him that Egypt had Israel under the thrall for four centuries. And so he sent Moses at that fixed moment. It mattered that the church of the day had the, the, the body of Christ in spiritual darkness. And so he raised up some forerunners and then touched that Augustinian monk and priest, that doctor of theology named Martin Luther, and said, it's time for you to enter the stage. You already know your lines. Action. He cared, that's why, because people matter. Amen? Why did he interrupt history 2,000 years ago and allow his eternally begotten son, the Lord Jesus, to enter the bloodstream of humanity? Because you matter. I matter. Jesus said one soul is worth the whole world. We matter. We cost the Son of God his life blood because we matter. He's got the hairs of your head numbered. Little bird doesn't fall to the ground without his sovereign permission. Listen to David. You were there when I was knit together in my mother's womb. Before I say a word, you know it all together. You understand my thought afar off. Well, how can that be? Because he's always watching. He's always observing. He says to the psalmist, I'll guide you with my eye. Don't be like the horse that needs the bit and bridle. I'll guide you with my eye. What's that mean? You ever have that? You're talking to somebody, they look good, smell good, seem good, and the Lord has his eye on you. In other words, halt, go no further. This person has a hidden agenda, and how much trouble did that save you? Why? Because you matter. All of the verses which follow in this portion of Scripture use the word F, season, or keros in Greek. Why? Because nothing very, very good or very, very bad... Lasts for very, very long. How many are glad? Amen. Bible language, this too shall pass. Some of the best words in the Bible, Old or New Testament, are, and it came to pass. <laughs> Once it comes, sometimes we want it to pass. Amen? Yeah, it's, it's, the, it's the flow of life. Verse 4 in our text this morning says, It's a season to weep and a season to laugh. Some Christians don't know what to do with each season. How many of you know scriptures that have been used by unwise believers to give the wrong medicine at the wrong time? It says in the Bible, weep with those who weep. How do you like it when you're in a, in a, in a pit, you're, you're down in the depths, and some well-meaning, ignorant Christian says, take two scriptures and call me in the morning. Well, now you know grief, that's a spirit. What? You can't find scripture an inch long. I've heard of Christians, after someone has lost a loved one, trying to cast a, a devil of, uh, of mourning out of a believer. Weep with those that weep. Rejoice with those that rejoice. Don't sing songs to a heavy heart. What should I do? Nothing. Maybe nothing. Maybe just get alongside them. Maybe just put your arm on their shoulder. Maybe just hold their hand. Well, I don't know what to say. Well, then I reckon you shouldn't say anything. Never thought of that. That's good. Now, now, preacher, when my unsafe friends ask me a Bible question, I don't know the answer to. What do I do then? You know, where did Cain get his wife? You know, who cares? As long as he was satisfied. What do I say? What do I say? Uh, I don't know. Oh, am I, is it okay if I don't know everything? Well, Paul seemed to think so. I know in part. I prophesy in part. Does that mean give up and don't say anything? No, it says say what you know. Share what you have. It's, uh, you're blessed according to the Lord, according to what you have, not according to what you don't have. This is the flow of life. It's very wise to understand the ebb and flow. We've said it a million times, but it bears repeating. Moses was called to deliver Israel at the age of 40. Read Acts 7. He was called to be their deliverer. They didn't get the memo. It was the wrong season, and so it was another 40 years before Moses led them out of bondage. Paul was called to minister to the Gentiles the day of his conversion. 
But he didn't start doing it until another 13 or 15 years had passed. In the meantime, he ministered to the to the Jews. Weeping. Weeping sometimes lasts for a night. Hopefully not your lifetime. Weeping may lodge for a night, but it does lodge, right? If you didn't, weren't here, get my message to the night visitor. Some of the hyper-faith people don't know that verse. My goodness. And then there's a, there's, a, there's a time to lament, weep. There's a time to dance. This word lament means to wail, to mourn. For, from what? Usually some kind of a death or disaster. How many know that America's had a lot of those lately? War? Can anybody spell war? Did Solomon have an insight into life as we live it? You better believe he did. War, sickness, it can sometimes refer to lamenting over the awareness of our own sinfulness. And in Bible days, it was, uh, it was expressed by the whole person. You read that they would tear their clothes, that they would put sackcloth on their head, that they would fast, that they would wear rough clothing. What were they saying? Hey, this is touching the whole me, this life event, this season that I'm in, season of loss, season of sickness, season of financial reverse, season of loneliness, season of recovery from from some tragedy or trauma. This is affecting me. And the Hebrews understood it. They looked at man holistically. They didn't divide the spirit from the soul. They kind of saw us as a whole being, which we are, really. You ever see pictures of the, the wailing wall? A lot of Jewish people will rock when they're, when they're praying. Their whole man is involved. There's nothing wrong with that. How many here have ever cried? over something. You too? Yeah. And don't be afraid of that. We shouldn't be surprised or, or disappointed in physical reactions. It's, but it's important to react the appropriate way for the appropriate experience. Right? It's appropriate to, to shout for joy when good things happen. To dance. Kick up your heels. Jesus said, you know what? If, if they persecute you, cheer up. That's the way they treated the true prophets of God from eternity past. They always persecute. You're, you're, you're part of the right club. Kick your heels up and dance. Your reward is great in the kingdom of heaven. Payday isn't always on Friday. How many figured that one out? Shout for joy if you want. Dance. I told you when I was in England and Michelle Robinson got two new teeth in about 30 seconds. You know what the host pastor said? Bro Brother Graham, he's in heaven now. You know what Brian said? He didn't say anything. Michelle said, I, I got two new teeth between when Pastor Joe slapped me in the face and I got back to my seat. Two new teeth. And everybody was crowded around looking at them. They were a different color. She had one broken in pieces, one abscessed, and there they were. Brand new teeth. I looked at Brian. I said, what do you reckon? He looked at me. His face was red as a rose. I could still see him. That long chin, big bushy mustache, and a dignified English guy. He looked at me. He had a red songbook in his hand. He just threw it in the air. <laughs> He was speechless. That's something for a preacher. What was he doing? He was expressing his excitement. Not everybody got it. She went home. Her mother said, you have what? She said, I got two new teeth. Look, mom, how did you find a dentist open Sunday night? She said, no, no, no. That Yankee preacher prayed. He, slayed. he didn't really pray for me. Slapped me in the face. He said he saw the, law, the light, light of God on my face. He slapped me in the face. She said, by the time I got back to my seat, felt like I'd been to the dentist. I could taste like when you go to the dentist. And the mother said, so how did you find a dentist open on a Sunday night? Never did accept it. Never did. Two different reactions to the same thing. Flow of life. The same brother Graham cried, joys of, uh, uh, cried, cried tears of joy during a revival in Greece in Athens. Looked at me as the people were all over the, all over the place, falling over each other. You couldn't even get close to people toward the end of the meeting because they would just fall out. And they, we were there for hours. He looked at me, same man, looked up, crying his eyes out. He said, I've been waiting over two decades to see this. He did the same, the right thing. Guess what? Brother Graham was in the hotel room with me in, during the same meetings, and he was crying again at night, but different tears. Have you ever had two seasons together? Two seasons together, laughing, crying, lamenting, rejoicing at one and the same time. We would go to the meetings, and I, I, I think I shared this. It got to the place where I told Brian on the way we, we were able to walk from our hotel. 
I, I, I told Brian, I said, you know, I think I could say Kawasaki, let the good times roll tonight, not even preach, we'd have the same thing. It was a set time, it was a fixed time in God's mind. And we would rejoice and cry and laugh, go back to the hotel room, he'd be thinking about his wife who was in the middle of a nervous breakdown. My wife was in the hospital with a nervous situation. His wife, uh, about third, third or fourth time for her, and his daughter was being abused by her husband, beaten and so on. And he, we'd, he'd cry, I'd cry over that privately, different kinds of tears. Get to the service and we'd cry tears of joy. You can have two seasons at one and the same time. While this is a strange season for our fellowship with so many people un, unable to attend at, for different reasons, plus a handful of people facing physical conditions, and yet at the same time, people are still getting healed. People are still receiving the Holy Ghost. People are still getting their prayers answered. And the online ministry continues to expand and explode. It's quite amazing, isn't it? Why do we have change of seasons and sometimes seasons of good and evil at the same time? Because we matter. And even in the valley, Jesus is with us, just like he is on the mountaintop. He never changes and he never leaves. He's there 24-7. Sometimes when I'm in the middle of something, I have to remind myself like that one preacher suggests. Put my hands on my stomach. Out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. I did that the other day, and I, I felt like the Spirit of the Lord said, well, I wish you'd let me loose more often. I thought, oh, yeah, that's right. I was starting to reason things out and worry some more. I just stopped. Flip the switch and stop my own language and let his language come out. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Seasons change because we matter. Lord moved on me the other day to, to pray a lot in the Holy Ghost through the day. And that night I, I checked my blood pressure. It had gone down 30 points. 30 points within about an hour. I said, well, I hadn't done anything different. Oh, yes, you did. You've been praying here in the Holy Ghost, watching TV. Oh, you can't do that. Well, yes, you can. You'd be surprised when you can pray in the Holy Ghost. So I don't counsel much anymore. But when I do, while someone's talking to me, I'm talking to God. And they're not giving me the whole story. And God's giving me the, the rest. Because I'm talking in tongues, undertone. And God's given me answers to their questions. How many believe God can make you wiser than a serpent, harmless as a dove? You better believe it. Yeah. Why? Because we matter. The hairs of our head are numbered. You believe that? The other day I got a phone call. I couldn't make it out too well. I knew it was long distance. I said, who are you? He said, John. I said, what? He said, John. I said, what do you, what do you want? He said, well, uh, I, want, I, I couldn't make it out too well, but I think he said, I want deliverance and I want to receive the Holy Ghost. I said, where are you calling from? Bad connection. And I said, can you say that again? He said, Kenya. I said, oh, yeah. So I said, well, let me pray for you, and then you'll receive the Holy Ghost. So I prayed for him for deliverance. I don't know what it was. And I told him a little bit. He understood. And I said, you know, receive the Holy Ghost. And the cackling on the line, I couldn't quite make it out. And I encouraged him to read some books. You know, I said, let me know how things go. And I just hung up. The next day, the very next day, phone rings again, some strange number. I thought, what's this? I wasn't even supposed to be there. It was my day off, and I picked up the phone. I said, hello. I could hear that long distance. Better connection. He said, I said, hello. He said, this brother John. I said, John. He says, yeah. I said, where are you calling from? He said, Kenya. I said, you know, you could email me. It'd be cheaper. <laughs> and I said, what's up? He said, thank you, thank you, thank you. I said, for what? He said, I received the Holy Ghost when you prayed for me. He said, I prayed in tongues all afternoon. He said, I woke up in the middle of the night talking in tongues. He said, this is great. I said, well, good on you. I said, what do you, what, what do you want? He said, I want you to pray for my ministry. I said, are you in the ministry? He said, not really. I'm a layman, but I want to be used of God. And I prayed for him again. He says, now, who is this? I said, I'm Joe. Joe who? I said, I'm Joe Kostelnik. He said, what? I said, I'm Joe Kostelnik. He said, wait a minute. Are you Brother Kostelnik? I said, yes. He said, I can't believe I'm talking to you. <laughs> well, who else would you be talking to? Bless his heart. Lovely guy. He said, I can't believe this. He said, all these other big shots, you can't get anywhere near them. And of course, I had a little laugh over that. Many of you know. I told somebody recently in a letter, I said, I said uh, you know, Pastor Prince had told me his life was changed by my books and all that. And I'm thinking to myself, he's got 30,000 members in Singapore. We're just trying to keep the doors open. God's got a sense of humor, brother, sister. You believe that? And he said, he said they, I couldn't even get near to anybody. I said, I can't believe I'm talking to you. I said, well... Um, get out more. You need to get out more. <laughs> but uh, I prayed for him and told him some books. I, I, I you know, encouraged him to read. And then I hung up and I thought, isn't that something? Autumn, the season of change. He went from not spirit-filled to spirit-filled. 
He went from bound to delivered. 10,000 or more miles, however long Kenya is, through a phone call. How cool is that? Why did that, why did that happen? Because you, he matters. And if you're in one season and want to be in another, there's our third sign. Don't give up. Don't give up. So, oh, bless God. It's not one darn thing after another. It's one darn thing over and over. Lord, I want to change a season. You know, you too? Well, guess what? Don't give up. It might be closer than you think. My mentor said most of us quit praying, quit believing, quit expecting about five minutes too soon. Dr. Peel in one of his books talked about a picture that he saw of a pickaxe stuck in the dry ground. Dry ground. He said you could just look at that picture and see that prospector gave up. Who knows what happened to him? Read the rest of the story. Another couple of prospectors came. They found a gold vine, gold vein, I should say, about five feet from where that man gave up. Just imagine if he'd held on, dug a little longer. I lamented that I couldn't get to Australia when I was in graduate school. Six long years wasn't the right time. My season was any time. God's fixed time was 1982. It finally came. Thank God. Been there uh, five times. Praise God. Amen. As Jeremiah told us last week, it's important to patiently wait for the Lord. Wait for the change of seasons because they always come. Israel did leave Egypt. Israel did come back from Babylon to their promised land. Jesus did arrive right on time. Paul did preach to the Gentiles. Amen? The Reformation did happen. Your sickness will be healed. Your bondage will be broken. Amen? Your empty life will be filled to overflowing with the presence of God, just like John in Kenya. Maybe this is uh, your season of change this autumn. Don't give up. Maybe you've been sowing, sowing, sowing. The Bible says you'll reap, I'll reap if we're not fainting. Autumn, the season of change, perhaps for you, perhaps for me, perhaps for our fellowship, perhaps for our ministry in other ways, perhaps for people we know about, perhaps for all of us. Seasons change because you and I matter. Our times are in his hands. We're going to reap. We're going to change seasons if we keep on keeping on. Don't give up. Don't give up and realize you matter. Father, thank you today for this encouragement. Bless the people that are putting these little signs up. And bless you, Holy Spirit, that can enable us to see things we haven't seen and have them resonate in such a way we can not only be blessed, but bless others. We're praying today, Lord, for those who are members of this fellowship, so many that can't, for some reason, be here for many of the services right now in this season. Thank you, Lord, that the seasons can change. Thank you that you have told us at least 11 different times through 11 different people with 11 different but similar dreams, you have a new crew coming. It's happened how many times in the past? Thank you, Lord, in advance that it comes in the future. Thank you for the season of change for many of our people. We pray for people, Lord, that are part of our fellowship. We pray for people that are not but feel a kinship to cooperate and partner with an apostolic ministry. Lord Jesus, we thank you for folks around the tri-state, across America, and around the world who pray, who support, who who. who Offer encouragement who email testimonies, who call with good reports. We pray for anyone and everyone that prays, that attends, that supports, that serves. Let everything that they expend come back a thousand times over in a harvest where they need it most. When it hits, when it, hits, when it comes, let them know it was the hand of God. Lord Jesus, we're ready for a miracle this morning. We're ready, Lord, to dine in heaven while we're still on earth. Lord Jesus, our omnipresent Savior, be especially present with us this morning, sacramentally, as we pray and distribute these elements, as we receive these elements, as the words of institution are spoken, as we partake of these emblems. Lord, thank you that right alongside the bread and cup, your risen flesh, your risen blood is one. And that we dine, Lord, on heaven and on earth at one and the same time. Thank you for eyes to see beyond the veil 
of the bread, beyond the veil of the cup, to the body and blood of Jesus that they contain during this time of celebration. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. If he's your master, if he's your all in all, we encourage you to join with us today. While we're getting ready here, we encourage you to go ahead and get some bread and grape juice or whatever your church uses for communion and, and settle your heart and mind with us and join us as we come around the Lord's table. We don't know what you believe about it, but we know what the Bible teaches. And it's more than a symbol. It's more than a spiritual experience. We believe what uh, Martin Luther discovered in the text of the New Testament that somehow in a way we don't understand that he called a sacramental union at one and the same time, not forever, but during the service, the body and blood of Christ are in, with, and under that bread and that cup. And it's life-changing if you can believe it. Come and join us wherever you are this morning. Father God, we acknowledge your presence here in this place. For you have promised to be wherever your people gather in your name to worship you. Times of refreshing here in your grace.
Lord's Supper with us. Um, this might be for somebody watching by Facebook or YouTube, um, listening down the road sometime. Might be for someone here. Might be for someone downloading the message. I'm not really sure. Um, might be for several people. But as I was praying here, I was reminded of a book I read just recently about the Lord's Supper. Um, the, the author did not look at it in the way that we do and in what I think is the biblical way, but had some really nice thoughts regardless. And about when we come around the Lord's table, if we recognize we're actually in his intimate fellowship, his intimate presence, in a few moments he will actually literally be here. Can you imagine the enemy scattering? Bad enough to be reminded of his defeat 2,000 years ago, but to be brought up close and personal with the living Christ, the living flesh, the living blood of Jesus. Aren't you glad we can go to church? You understand why it's a sanctuary, an oasis? There's not a demon in a, within a country mile of this place. But this author was saying, among other things, we have to also examine our own hearts and lives. And I had this feeling, I had this sense, very strong. Again, it could be for many people. But I had this, this idea of this person who's got a, a bad attitude towards someone. And it's almost like, as you think about this person, uh, you rehearse what they do, what they say, what they've done, whatever. You keep rehearsing that, and your, your chest kind of gets... It gets more and more puffed up as you sort of on the high horse look down at that person and, and keep rehearsing and nursing what, they're, what it is that grinds your gears. And, and it was like the Lord kind of impressed me. If these kinds of people only knew what other people are thinking about them, wow, he's bitter. Have you noticed how down she is? Wow, they're, they, they, they look like they're carrying around a black cloak of darkness. And the person has no idea. It's like I hear the Lord saying, don't judge somebody else by your half a bushel. Don't check somebody else's shirt collar to yours is clean, clean. Why would you even think about pulling a speck out of somebody else's eye when you've got a log in your own? If you only knew that was the, the sense I had. If this person, whoever they are, they p p plural, if they only knew what other people are seeing in them. They would let go of that bitterness, that judgmentalism, that critical attitude. That, that um, I keep, boy, it's like I'm seeing their life. How many, no, I don't usually interrupt the Lord's Supper. That this seems so important. It could be for somebody overseas. Who knows? I don't know. But take that to heart. Father, we let go of any untoward feelings we have towards someone. Who are we? There's one lawgiver and judge who's able to save and to destroy we, who are we to judge someone different than us, James says. Stop holding on to anger, Paul said. Stop giving the devil a wide open space in your life. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Father, we let go of anger and criticism and judgmentalism toward others and the grudge holding and the bitter spirit and the ruminating and rehearsing over and over what we didn't approve of or what we thought was negative. Lord, forgive us for usurping your throne and trying to be judge, jury, and executioner. Forgive us, Lord, for what it's doing to our own health, our own spiritual life, our own attitude. Lord, we release these thoughts and judgments. We thank you that they've already been forgiven through the blood of Jesus. We thank you that the one we're so concerned about, missing God and being out of place, their sins have already been forgiven through the blood of Jesus. Thanks for waking all of us up, Lord, and reminding us that we were darkness, but now we're light in the Lord. We walk in the light as children of light, and the blood of Jesus, your Son, is constantly cleansing us from every sin. Thank you, Lord, where we see division in the flesh. You see only the unity of the body of Christ and your one church composed of many members. None of us is perfect. We're walking and we're working on it, Lord. Thank you for accepting us all the while as we are. We rejoice in your forgiveness and the cleansing power of your blood today. We thank you for offering us a reminder to release others and ourselves from anything and everything that's not of you, anything that's not love. And we thank you in advance, Lord, for the course correction as we come around your table.
And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and he blessed and broke it, and he gave to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, All of you drink out of it, for this is my blood, the one of the New Testament, which is being shed for many for the remission of sins. Every time we do this, I'm just reminded of Moses in the Old Testament after the giving of the law sprinkled blood on the congregation as a sign that they've been sealed under that covenant. And every time we celebrate the Lord's Supper, I just have that same sense. It's an affirming of your sealing. In the here and now, the same blood that purchased you out of sin, out of your old way of life, out of judgment, out of condemnation, that same blood that Jesus spilled from the cross and before as he was whipped and beaten, that same blood is affirming and perfecting and, and ratifying your being sealed. The, the same blood that you've just drunk now, the same blood you are sealed let your faith rise when troubles come, when the devil speaks his lies into your ear. Let faith rise. Remember that you've been sealed by his blood. Every time you celebrate this supper, you're affirming that. His blood is powerful. His blood is life. His blood is victory. His blood is holy. And we're so blessed to partake. Amen. 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 To be with you again. We've got some coffee out there uh, if you want to spend some time fellowshipping. And uh, speaking of Greg, uh, pre please again pray for Monica's dad. And a uh, wonderful story there about being able to be back in touch after a lot of years. And it's wonderful to be able to pray for our loved ones. Amen. If you need prayer, we're always here to agree with you and join our faith with yours. Yahweh blesses you and keeps you and protects you. Yahweh makes his face shine on you. He's gracious, merciful, and benevolent toward you. Yahweh lifts up his countenance upon you and grants you his shalom.
Amen. See you Wednesday. Don't forget, if you possibly can, be here next Lord's Day and bring someone with you. Reformation Sunday. It's going to be a beautiful day to celebrate our victory in Christ. Salvation by faith, plus nothing, minus nothing. Amen. Came at a great price. My soul is restored.